We're going to dive right on in. We're in our seventh week of our study of the book of Exodus. Um, Just to kind of quickly, quickly recap where we've been. Uh, We're talking about God's people, the Israelites, and that they are in Egypt. They're oppressed. They're enslaved. And God has called Moses to lead his people out of Egypt. Last week, we saw, again, Moses going to Pharaoh, going, hey, let my people go. And what's he say? Nope. Nope. Just like God's told Moses that that Pharaoh's going to do multiple times, he would do this. In fact, he says in verse 3 of chapter 7, but I'll make Pharaoh's heart stubborn so I can multiply my miraculous signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. See, signs and wonders have an ability to point beyond themselves. Signs and wonders are intended to provoke a response before a greater power becomes necessary. In verse 4, even then Pharaoh will refuse to listen to you. So I will bring down my fist on Egypt. Then I will rescue my forces, my people, the Israelites, from the land of Egypt with the great acts of judgment. When I raise my powerful hand and bring out the Israelites, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So that's the question so much of Exodus is about. This is the question that frames the whole book. Who is the Lord? Pharaoh's asking, like, who's the Lord? Uh, Because last time I checked, I am this guy right here. That's who's the Lord. Me, Pharaoh, the all-encompassing sun god himself sitting on the throne. He thinks he's the Lord. What a wake-up call he's going to get. The people of Egypt are asking, who is the Lord? The Israelites are asking, hey, wait a minute, who is the Lord? Because last time I checked, we're supposed to be in some promised land, and we ain't there. We're, in fact, now we're enslaved, now we're oppressed, now we're making bricks for a living. Uh, I don't remember this being a part of the plan. And remember, as we see, we talked about God's going to be getting closer and closer and closer in this book of Exodus. And that this is the big picture. This is the development of God's relationship with his people. Remember the four promises that we talked about last week in chapter 6, 6 through 8. What is it? I will bring you out, God says to his people. I will rescue you. I will redeem you. I will take you as my people. And these people through whom he will bring everybody back together. Today the story will take us to some questions. In fact, that some people say this. This is exactly the reason why I don't believe in Christianity. With the subject that we're going to be looking at today. Or they're going to say, yep, that's why I can't believe in God. Because how could a God who supposedly is good, well, he did all of that. It's because of the violent way God moves this story forward. And a warning. It's going to hurt your head a little, maybe even a lot. At least it does mine. It doesn't take much, but it certainly does when I wrestle through these questions. Last week, we got through the very first plague of the ten plagues. We wrestled around with this theology of the plagues even. Like, what was the plagues for? What what was the specific purpose? And we we talked about the theories of, you know, each, each plague was being addressed by a particular god that the Egyptians had, and God was showing his power over those little puny small g gods. They could only do so much. Um, maybe they were showing his kindness to the people. But today we're going to take even a deeper look. I was actually thinking that maybe... Let's just skip chapter 6 through 12, if we're honest. I mean, who wants to go through the blood and the mess and the nastiness, right? Let's just skip it. Let's get to the good God, right? Oh, we're coming out of Egypt. We're going through the Red Sea. Everything's good now. Let's just skip it, right? No, we're not going to do that because I think it takes away from the power of God showing how he is and his story would be lost. We would miss, I think, some of God's character coming out too. His patience. Think about it. Ten plagues. How many opportunities is he giving Pharaoh to say, all right, people, get out of here. And for those of you who recall even the study in Revelation, you looked at the tribulation part there. How reflective this part is with with what's going to happen later. Again, you could say that's pretty violent stuff, but it's like how many opportunities does God give us to go, hey, maybe I need to start paying attention to what he's wanting here because this ain't working over here. And then back here in Exodus, we'd miss pieces of Pharaoh's character. He's not a very smart man. you got to admit it. He is, he is not the brightest bulb in the light at all. I mean, how many times does it take to get to the point that 
This ain't working for you, dude. Your pride, your ego, it ain't working. Chapter 7, we see the first plague, turning the water to blood. And then we read in verse 25, seven days passed after the Lord struck the Nile. Now, you'll notice that there's sometimes a periods of time mentioned between these plagues. Sometimes very little, and for the most part, we don't really know exact times. That's not what's really important here. And then it goes on to the next plague, the frogs. Chapter 8, then the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh and say to him, this is what the Lord says, let my people go so that they may worship me. If you refuse to let them go, I will send a plague of frogs on your whole country. The Nile will teem with frogs. They they will come up into your palace and and your bedroom and onto your bed and into the houses of your officials and on your people and into your ovens and kneading troughs. A lot of detail here. Frogs going to be everywhere. The frogs will come up on you and your people and all your officials. See, that's what happened. Frogs came. They were everywhere. Imagine opening a drawer. Rivet right out in your face, right? You're going to put your shoes on. Oh, you know, everywhere. Check your undies before you go putting them on, right? I mean, I'm just saying they're everywhere. That's what happened though. And it says that Pharaoh's magicians, what did they do? They matched it. They matched it. Again, they can only mimic If they were really good magicians, wouldn't they have, like, gotten rid of the frogs? That's what I'd be going, um, hey, boys, come on, get rid of the frogs. What do they do? They matched it. What'd you do that for? Now you just added to it all. That's what Satan does, though. Again, he can't, he's very limited in his power. He wants to mimic, and he wants to actually add to it. He's going to try to impress you. See, I did it too, but it's actually adding to the mess in your life, okay? Side note there. Eventually, Pharaoh asked Moses to pray to God, hey, get rid of the frogs. Verse 9, Moses said to Pharaoh, I leave to you the honor of setting the time for me to pray for you and your officials and your people that you and your houses may be rid of the frogs, except for those that remain in the Nile. Tomorrow, Pharaoh said. Again, like, Pharaoh, dude, wake up. He's He's not very smart. Like, why not right now? Okay, Moses, do it now, please. Get us, we want to be done. Tomorrow? I'm sorry, it just strikes me as like this guy. Come on. Moses replied, it will be as you say, so that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. Then verse 12, after Moses and Aaron left Pharaoh, Moses cried out to the Lord about the frogs he had brought on Pharaoh. And the Lord did what Moses asked. The frogs died in the houses. (laughs) So you thought it was a mess before. In the courtyards and in the fields, they were piled. They were piled in heaps, and the land reeked of them. Now, you know, for for those of us who lived up north, you remember how the snow, like in the big parking lots, what do they do with the snow? They just kind of pile it up in one big pile, and it's it's like it becomes dirty after a while, and just kind of starts melting. It's really dirty. Now imagine a green sight to all this, and a stink like you've never smelled before. That's what's happened here piling it all up here. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart and would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said. We, we never do that, right? Oh, Lord, I need you. I need you. Please, please, will you please come help? And he does. And we're like, yeah, thanks. Back to my own agenda again. See, it's scary how much I can look at this and go, yeah, I'm Pharaoh. Yup. I got pride. I got ego. I've got my way. I've got my agenda. You're probably not like that, though. (laughs) You're probably not. Just me. But notice this pattern in each of the plagues. There's a judgment. There's a plague. Oh, help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. And then he does. And we're like, yeah, thanks for nothing. I'm moving on. Oh, and by the way, no, you can't have that. You can't have that part of my life. You can't have this. No, sorry. So anybody who says the book of Exodus is irrelevant to our lives. Ha! Turned, uh, number three, third plague. He turned (laughs) the dust into gnats. I hate gnats. They're like always like high pits going in your ears and in your eyes and everywhere. It's just, oh. 
Now, it says this with this one, the magicians could not match it. In fact, they said, we think this one might be from the finger of God. I know, as if the other ones weren't. So, um, but again, Pharaoh would not listen. Then come to verses 20 through 30. Flies. I, I mean, man, all these things are just things that just like, I just don't get away. I hate him. Flies. But again, not to where the Israelites lived. Look at verse 22. God says, so that you will know that I, the Lord, am in this land. I will make a distinction between my people and your people. So the flies come, and in verse 24, eat, all throughout Egypt, the land was ruined by the flies. The land is now ruined. It's not just making a mess of your bed or anything else or the, the palace. The whole land is getting ruined at this point. One man's pride is ruining an entire nation. Never see that today, do we? Come on. Pharaoh is so caught up in this game of dueling banjos with, between his magicians and Moses' God that he's, he misses what is going on in his land to his own people. Pharaoh says, well, why don't you just go sacrifice to your God right here? I mean, we got a place. Come on. Moses says, no, we have to go to the wilderness. We have to do what God says us to, to do. And Pharaoh said, well, okay, but don't go far. And so the flies then are removed, but Pharaoh changes his mind again. Chapter 9, the fifth plague, plague on the livestock. Not Israel's though. Pharaoh still says no. Then comes the boils. This is happy, happy, joyful stuff today, isn't it? I mean, I'm just saying, you're feeling really good right now. Like, I'm so glad I came to church. Boils. Verses 8 through 12, come, they come from handfuls of soot from a furnace tossed in the air in Pharaoh's presence. Verse 13, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Get up early in the morning, confront Pharaoh and say to him, This is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says, Let my people go so that they may worship me, or this time I will send the full force of my plagues against you and against your officials and all your people, so that you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. And then God promises the worst <laughs> hailstorm ever. I'm not sure what they've had before in Egypt, but it's going to be bad. And anyone not brought inside will die. So in 13 through 35, there you see hail, hailstones. Like we've seen that recently. There's been some hailstorms causing massive damage. And if you were outside, there were people that, that were killed. It can take out your livestock and strip the trees, everything. And it came, lightning flashed back and forth. It beat down everything growing and stripped every tree. Again, except for where the Israelites were, over in Goshen. Now, if I'm, if I'm your average Egyptian there, I'm making my way to Goshen. Because I'm saying, hey, um, I kind of noticed you don't have any of this going on. And it's supposedly your God that's doing all that. And my gods are not doing anything for me. So can you tell me about your God? See, Pharaoh could have had a much different response. Much different. But it's amazing when pride gets in the way. It's amazing when ego gets in the way. And we pit ourselves against God. Verse 27, then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron. All right, this time I've sinned, he said to them. The Lord is in the right, and I and my people are in the wrong. Pray to the Lord, for we have had enough thunder and hail, and I will let you go. You don't have to stay any longer. You're thinking he's getting it. Moses prays. The hail stops. Pharaoh lies again. Then chapter 10, Moses then promises to Pharaoh locusts that are going to cover the ground. Verse 7, Pharaoh's officials said to him, How long will this man be a stare to us? Let the people go so that they may worship the Lord their God. Do you not yet realize that Egypt is ruined? Like because of your stupidity and your pride and your actions, we're all suffering for it. We're all paying the price here. And now you've ruined the whole country because you're an egomaniac. And you're not going to bend the knee to this God. Will you not wake up? Even his own advisors are now saying, 
So Pharaoh says, okay, you can go, um, but, you gotta, but you can't take your women and children. Moses says, that's not the deal. And so the locusts come. And it says in verse 15, they covered all the ground until it was black. Imagine walking in that. Crunch, crunch. Pharaoh says, hey, hey, okay, I messed up again. Forgive my sin. Same result, though. They pray, the locusts go away. And he says, oh, yeah, no, you're not going anywhere. Then the ninth plague. Darkness. For three days. No one could see anyone else a move or move about for three days, except where the Israelites lived. Just Goshen. Just the one place. Now imagine any time they did move around in the darkness, what are you stepping on? Frog carcasses, locusts, carcasses, there's crunching, there's oozing, there's all this nastiness. You're like, I don't even want to know what my feet are going in next. Pharaoh says, okay, everyone can go. Oh, but leave your flocks and herds. Leave those behind. Moses says, no deal. Verse 27, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he was not willing to let them go. Pharaoh said to Moses, get out of my sight. Make sure you do not be, be, uh, appear before me again. The day you see my face, you will die. Well, just as you say, Moses replied, I will never appear before you, before you again. We can have the lights back on now. So what I wrestle with in this story is what evidently I think a lot of the world wrestles with, isn't it? What kind of God is this violent? And we've not even read the 10th plague yet. Next week, it's going to get even worse, which I've handed over to Brenton and my son-in-law, Jacob, and they're going to do it. <laughs> welcome to it, boys. So you're welcome. So, hey, you guys are going to knock it out. I love it. Um, the Christian boys will be here um, uh, sharing that with us. So there was an article out several years ago from USA Today, and it was How America Sees God. And it gave four views. There's actually five, but, but uh, here's what the views that they thought they see of God. The authoritative God, the benevolent God, the critical God, and the distant God. And it said like 28% believed in this authoritative God. Like that, and this was all in America, so it was, a, it was Americans giving this, this poll here. But America, they believe that America will lose God's favor unless we get right with him. And they believe that a God engaged in history and doling out harsh punishment to those who do not follow him. Like nearly 28% believed in that kind of God, this authoritative God. The benevolent God, about 22% believed in this God, that he's less likely to think God judges and punishes human behavior. They see God as mainly a force of positive influence in the world. And that the question of tragedy clearly reveals an important distinction between the authoritative and the benevolent gods. Then about 21% believed in this critical God. Like, imagine a God who is so judgmental of humans, but rarely acts on earth. Perhaps reserving final judgment for the afterlife. And then there was about 24% believed in the distant God. Like, there's a, just a cosmic force that, that set the laws of nature into motion, but does not do anything in the world and really holds no clear opinions on anything. They basically just booted up the universe and left humanity alone. About 24% of people in America believe in that kind of God. Of course, the fifth view was, we don't believe in any God at all. And today, according to Gallup, uh, Gallup poll, 17% of Americans believe that there is no God at all. So, this question of who is the Lord... <laughs> quite a bit relevant for today, isn't it? Unbelievably so. We can see the character of Israel getting played out in this discussion, too, and the character of Egypt being played out. I wonder about the Egyptians' response. I, I mentioned it earlier, like, if it was me, I'm on my way to Goshen. Tell me about this God. Tell me about this God. Get me out of here. Get me out of this mess. 
Like, we always read this from Israel's perspective. He came to rescue us. But, but what about the Egyptians? Is it really their fault too? When we read it from Israel's perspective, it's like triumphant God. From Egypt's, not so much. I mean, but what if we read it only that way? Like, he rescued us. I think then we'd be ignoring some real questions here, some really difficult questions. Like, what is God doing with Egypt in this situation? Or is God only for Israel and against Egypt? Can God be against us? Is this God's judgment, his wrath on Egypt? Is God a violent and mean God sometimes? If this isn't God's wrath, why all this suffering? I mean, why not do it another way? And 10 times, 10 plagues, seriously? Did you not get your point across? Does God not care about the Egyptians? I mean, I think those are valid questions that should be asked, could be asked, right? Certainly, we can understand how those who would read this story for the first time, especially looking at the plagues, could ask themselves, is God really like that? Maybe you've had those questions. And if he is, how could he? See, we never enter into the story from Egypt's perspective, and I don't know that we always have to either. But I can't either just avoid these questions, and I can't act like they don't exist. I'm sure each of you have had different questions like this. Because then I fall right into these same characterizations of God that make me reduce him to four choices if I don't ask those questions. Right? How do I reconcile that this God who gives us the plagues is the same God we know in Jesus? If he's really God, wouldn't he have rescued the Egyptians too? What do I do with these violent and cruel images of God? If you look at the images of God we have today and the images of God throughout history, you, you see that our images and our understandings of God, they continue to change and even mature over the centuries. And throughout scripture, it appears to me that God initiates this change. I think it's when we refuse to pay attention to this that God gets sort of locked in and is only can be this way, authoritative or benevolent or critical or distant. And when I say that about God continuing to evolve and change, here's what I'm not saying, okay? This is not what Paul is saying here. I'm not saying that the Bible doesn't have passages that depict God as violent and cruel. Neither am I saying that these passages are the last word on the character of God. Also, I'm not saying that the Bible shows God maturing, like he starts out as, a, as rather adolescent, but then, you know, starts to make a better turn and grows up rather nice over the last few centuries. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that human beings can't do any better than their very best at any given moment to communicate about God as they understand him, and that the scripture faithfully reveals the evolution of the writer's best attempts to communicate their best understanding of God. For me, understanding this story from beginning to end of God putting things to rights, bringing the family back together, making everything good, back to the way it's supposed to be, can be challenging to say the least. However, the older I get and the maturing that takes place in me helps me grow in my understanding and acceptance of this God. I mean, who is far greater than me and has his ways are incredibly that much higher than my own. What if what's happening is happening here in the plagues? What if that's what's happening? What if what happens because if it continues in the same way, if the oppression continues of his people, it'll be prohibitive to God making things right and bringing us all back together again. N.T. Wright, uh, I love N.T. Wright. He says this, he says, ever since the garden, ever since God's grief over Noah, ever since Babel and, Ab and the Abraham and Abraham and the story has been about the messy way in which God has had to work to bring the world out of this mess. Somehow, in a way, we are inclined to find offensive. God has to get his boots muddy, and it seems to get his hands bloody to, th to put the world back to rights. There's not a quick and easy solution for this mess, is there? The bringing and making things right and bringing us back together. It's messy. It's bloody. It wasn't a nice, clean Jesus up on the cross. Dirty, filthy, 
scarred, blood everywhere. Yeah, I'd say it takes a bit of a mess to make, clean it all up. I believe God, I believe it is God looking at this plan that he's had all along, and it's not going to be thwarted by Pharaoh or by anyone else. I think he's saying, I will go to extremes to protect and rescue you. After all, wouldn't we all do the same for our own families? Without, without hesitation, absolutely. God wants to redeem the oppressed from being oppressed. And I believe he wants to free the oppressors from the oppressing. God doesn't want to destroy Egypt. He wants to redeem them. It's all a part of the one story. Even Egypt can be redeemed in this. Oh, and by the way, that gives you and I hope in it too. Pharaoh's not the target. The people are not the target. God has a plan, and it's not going to get thwarted. This isn't about God punishing the Egyptians. This is about the liberating and the rescuing the oppressed to bring us all back to what he intended for us. Shalom, that Hebrew word, peace, wholeness, the way things are meant to be, back with him together, back with each other together. That's what it's about. And what about Israel's place in this? I mean, God isn't only showing himself to Egypt in the plagues. Maybe more so he's revealing himself to Israel. Because by the way, they've been in Egypt for a long, long, long time. 400, like 430 years, or something like this. Perhaps they've gotten away from this God. Perhaps they've lost sight of who he really is, what he's all about, and his immense power. And more than that, his immense love for his people. Maybe he's happened to reveal himself to them. They're experiencing the plagues, although be it from a distance. They're going, wow, that's intense. I think if I were an Israelite in that state, I'd be down on my knees going, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. <sighs> Remember this question, who is the Lord? That, 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 that has to be answered by every single one of us. Certainly everyone in this story and you and I, especially us. As slow as Pharaoh was to understand, I wonder though if Israel got it right away or if it took all 10 plagues for them as well to go, oh, so you are God. So you are Yahweh. Well, how about that? So here's a huge question. Were the plagues a way for God to enter into the Israelites' lives with grace? They're, sh they're being shown grace over in Goshen incredible grace. They're not dealing with flies, gnats, and locusts. They're not dealing with it. Perhaps it sheds light on grace. Is this a story that's more about grace for Israel or more about punishment for Egypt? Because it, isn't it through the plagues that God enters into Israel's broken lives and broken nation and rescues them? So in understanding all of this story and the questions that come with it, in light of this story of rescue, then isn't it through the plagues that God entered into our broken lives and rescues us? Remember, what were we plagued with? Sin, death, just nastiness. And God, through Jesus, comes in, says, I'll take those on. I'll put them to death once for all. And now you get the grace. See, it's the precursor. This story is showing this is how God's going to bring rescue. He's saying, I'm going to come and rescue you. I'm the only one who can. I'm the only one who can. And he does rescue us through Jesus. That's the crucible of our story here. And we think that's why, well, that's what we do here at New Heart. That's why we do everything. We're trying to show this story. We're trying to live out this story. We're trying to help be a part of the rescue. Not just saving the lost, but like, like giving real hope. Showing this is a powerful God. He can take your mess and just stomp it and destroy it. And the brokenness, because that's what Jesus did already. That's called grace. Undeserved, beautiful grace. Jesus is the only one who can. 
So maybe you're here this morning and you need to be reminded of that truth, that there is a plan, God's plan, and it will not be thwarted. No matter who is in your life or if you're in your own life, messing it all up and getting in the way. God is greater than that. God's mercy and love is so much more powerful than that. It just, it removes all of the darkness. It brings real light and hope and peace into our lives once again. So if you're here and you need to get a hold of God, well then this is a moment for you to say, hey, I, I need this Jesus because <laughs> I can't seem to do right wrong. I can't seem to do wrong right. Jesus is the only one who can and does, and he enters into our lives and makes a way. So if you need that way, come forward this morning. Let's begin having that conversation. Nobody's going to force you into anything. We're not going to throw you into that baptistry and just dunk you and dunk you and dunk you. That's not how it is here. We're going to love and walk with you. We're going to begin a conversation we're going to see how God wants to enter into your life there and start to bring newness and hope and real life. Maybe you've gotten away from that and you, you've gotten away from that truth and you're just going, hey, uh, I got to get back on this path. If so, there's going to be some folks around here that you can pray with and begin to have that conversation. If you all would just make your way to that, please, our prayer intercessors, just make yourself available. These are wonderful folks that you can begin to have a conversation with and, uh, <laughs> And, and, and hear a bit of their story as well. And they'll tell you, yeah, I was once in the way of it all, and now I'm letting God have the way. And it's a beautiful way. Let's pray. If you will, just lower the lights, please. Let's just, let's just give this some time here. Holy Spirit, just rule and reign in this moment. Point us to you, Jesus. Point us to the author and perfecter of our faith, to our Savior, our Lord, our lover of our souls, the only one who can truly come and bring shalom, to bring us back to you. Bring us back to that relationship that you intended to have with us in the very first place. God, confront us if we're like on this other way. Confront us. Just going, hey, that's just going to bring you death. God, maybe, maybe some of us here need to be recognizing we have the same kind of uh, rebelliousness as Pharaoh, a stubbornness, a hardness to our hearts because of pride or ego or those past hurts and the past bitterness we just we want to continue to hold on to that keeps us from really living this life that you intend us for us to live. And so I just pray that, Lord, you give them courage and boldness to come forward and just go, I'm done. I'm done with that. We don't need to know about it. We just need to know it's done. We don't need to know the details because you know all of that, Lord. I just pray that you give them courage to go to somebody this morning and say, can you pray with me about this? Because we want to see you enter into that life and make all things new. So Lord, just, just move in this time as we sing, as we give ourselves over to you, as we're examining ourselves. Just may your Holy Spirit just be moving, counseling us, convicting us, guiding us again, and pointing us to you. Show your power here, Lord, in this time. Show your power in our lives. May this be a bold first step in that process, in that journey. We pray in Jesus' name.